For the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you why place and well-being are at the new frontier of medicine, environmental health, and design. How do you get from medicine to design? Well, I had three aha moments that brought me there. One was a single patient. The second was a single experiment, and the third was my own illness and healing. And each of these changed the course of my career and my life. It all started in 1979 when I was finishing my rheumatology fellowship training in uh, Montreal at McGill University on a Christmas Eve, a snowy Christmas Eve, and I was called to see a patient who had developed a scarring autoimmune inflammatory disease when being treated for a very rare form of epilepsy, a lethal form of epilepsy, with a drug that changed brain serotonin. And the doctors asked me, did that drug cause that disease? I knew enough to know that I didn't know the answer and I needed to look it up. And hard as it may be for some of you in the audience to believe, we didn't have smartphones or laptops or computers to do a PubMed search. And I had to run to the library and convince the librarian to stay late on Christmas Eve to do a PubMed search by connecting into the mainframe computer in Ottawa. And as we sat and watched the teletype machine start printing, I could see that indeed there was a study, one or two studies, that showed that there were abnormalities in serotonin in some patients with some autoimmune diseases. For me, that was enough to convince me that that was not a coincidence. But in those days, scientists and physicians did not believe that the brain and the immune system could talk to each other, much less believe that the mind-body connection was important in health or disease. But studying that patient convinced me. We went on to publish that paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I spent the next 30 years of my career trying to understand how that worked. By the time I got to the National Institutes of Health in 1989, I realized that in order to prove this connection, it wasn't enough to sprinkle serotonin on macrophages or immune cells in tissue culture, which is what I had been doing before. I had to show it in animals. You had to have an intact brain and an intact immune system to try to understand how these two systems communicate. I was studying a strain of rats that developed a whole host of autoimmune diseases when exposed to a variety of inflammatory triggers, like bits and pieces of streptococcal bacterial cell walls would give them something that looked like human rheumatoid arthritis. So I was testing an anti-serotonin anti drug in these rats, thinking it would be the next great cure for arthritis. And I was wrong. I was dead wrong. Instead of curing the rats that got arthritis, it killed their cousins that were ordinarily resistant to autoimmune inflammatory disease. And the only way I could explain that, because I knew something about that drug, it had been developed as an antihypertensive drug, and I knew that it blocked the brain's hormonal stress response. It blocked the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So I thought maybe what that drug was doing was taking the body's own way of shutting off inflammation. It was taking that away and preventing the animals from shutting off inflammation, and so they went on to die from septic shock. And that turned out to be correct. And we showed that the animals that were susceptible to getting inflammatory diseases had a blunted hypothalamic brain stress center, corticotropin-releasing hormone, a brain stress hormone, they had a blunted hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis response, so they were unable to make enough cortisone, corticosterone, to shut off inflammation as soon as it began. The arthritis-resistant cousins, the Fisher rats, 
had, in fact, a hyper-responsive brain stress response, made lots of cortisone, and were able to shut off that inflammation as soon as it began. We went on to show this was true across species and autoimmune diseases in chickens, mice, rats, humans with a whole host of autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus er erythematosus, um, thyroiditis, and so on. And in fact, those of us who were working on studying different parts of this brain immune connection finally put all of the pieces of the puzzle together and showed that there are many, many ways in which the brain and the immune system communicate. Many ways in which the brain sends signals to the immune system through hormones, through nerve pathways, at sites of inflammation, regionally in immune organs. And there are many ways in which the immune system sends signals back to the brain through immune molecules and through nerve pathways as well. So understanding and knowing that these pathways exist and knowing that by blocking these pathways, one can develop an autoimmune disease made it easier for scientists and physicians who didn't believe this connection to actually believe it in the language of science. We could understand it so we could believe it. And understanding that if you break those connections, you get autoimmune disease could help us to understand the reverse, the opposite. Too much cortisone, too much cortisol, as in chronic stress, can lead to a whole other set of diseases. In fact, diseases that result because the immune system is weakened and unable to fight disease. So health lays in a balance. Too much is not good and too little is not good. So we know that when you're chronically stressed, as in people who are caring for Alzheimer's patients, as in chronic, chronic marital distress, chronic work stress, and so on. When you're chronically stressed, you're more prone to more frequent and more severe viral infections. If you go out to get a flu shot, you have a lower take rate to that flu shot, so you're more likely to get the flu. If you have a wound and you're chronically stressed, it takes longer to heal, two to four weeks longer. And chronic stress can also speed cancer growth and metastases in certain solid tumors. Chronic stress can speed chromosomal aging. There are little ends of chromosomes called telomeres, and those shorten with age, and we can predict how old you are by the length of those telomeres. If you're chronically stressed, those ends of chromosomes can look 10 to 17 years older than your biological age. If that's not a reason to do something about stress, I don't know what is. So how does stress make you sick? You're stressed. Your brain's stress center starts pumping out these hormones, CRH, pituitary gland releases ACTH. Uh, the adrenal glands release cortisol. And we all know that cortisone, any of you who've used cortisone for a poison ivy rash or cortisone for rhinitis or uh, asthma, know that it is one of the most potent drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs, that your body makes. So when you're chronically stressed, you're giving yourself a whole lot of shots of anti-inflammatory cortisone. That tunes down your immune system's ability to fight infection. You're exposed to a, a bug, and the bug wins. So in 1989, and on through the 90s, I understood all this, that stress could make you sick, in an academic sort of way. I could hold the rat's hypothalamus in the palm of my hand. Uh, I could see that inflammation was worse or better. I didn't fully understand it until I went through a period of stress in my own life, got sick, and then had an experience that helped me heal. It was when my mother was dying of breast cancer and I was a long distance caregiver. And I was flying back and forth from Washington to Montreal and on one trip back I noticed that one of my knees had swelled up and then the other knee swelled. And then a few weeks later my elbows and my shoulders and my wrists began to ache. And here I was a rheumatologist, an arthritis specialist, and I realized that I had inflammatory arthritis. I was not listening to my body. 
I then had an experience that helped me do so. I moved into a new house, and the doorbell rang. And it was my new neighbors, who were Greek. And they came and brought me moussaka and dolmatis and tzatziki and all kinds of Greek food to welcome me. And they saw me writing on the computer what was to become my first book. And they asked me, are you a writer? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't think so. Why do you ask? And they said, oh, because we've always wanted a writer to stay in our cottage in Crete. So I said, I'm a writer. So I went with them to Crete, to this tiny village called Lentas. It was in, on the south coast of Crete. And I would spend every day sitting at the top of the hill in the doorway of a little Greek chapel that was built on the top of the ruins to a temple to Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And I would listen to the goats and the sheep and the birds. And I'd look out at the Mediterranean, the beautiful blue Mediterranean, and the fuchsia bougainvillea, and inhale the wonderful scent of sage and eucalyptus. And I didn't know I was meditating. I had no idea. I, didn't, I was too much of a scientist to admit that I was meditating. I was in the moment. I was swimming in the ocean every day. I was eating a healthy Mediterranean diet. I was surrounded by friends who supported me. And I began to ask, what was it about that experience that helped me heal? Because within 10 days, I felt so much better. I was supposed to go back in, uh, in Washington to go back into hospital and get more biopsies and an experimental drug uh, for arthritis. And I felt so much better that when I got back, I didn't need any of that. Was it what I saw? Was it what I heard? Was it what I smelled? Was it what I touched? Was it what I ate? Was it what I did in that space that helped me heal? And of course, it was all of the above. In science, we can ask questions like whether did something have an effect, whether it has an effect. We can ask how it has an effect. And we can break all those pieces down into their smallest controllable parts. So we can ask what, whether what you see can help you heal, can change your moods. I now live in Tucson, Arizona, and I drive home every day and have this gorgeous view of the Santa Catalina Mountains. And no matter how tired or stressed I might be, I feel calm when I look at those mountains. Well, it turns out that there are preferred scenes that people across all cultures prefer. And they're usually sweeping vistas and always views of nature. It turns out there is a part of the brain that specializes in beautiful views. It's called the parahippocampal cortex. Doesn't matter what it's called, but it specializes in beautiful views and preferred scenes. And it turns out that that part of the brain is rich in endorphins, those feel-good molecules. So Irving Biederman at the University of Southern California has a hypothesis that the reason we all pay more for a room with a view is because we're giving ourselves a shot of endorphins when we look at that view. You can ask the same question about light. We know that full spectrum sunlight is as effective, can be as effective in treating a form of depression called seasonal affective disorder as antidepressant drugs. And studies have shown in Canada in the winter and Italy in the summer that patients on the sunny side of the ward with many forms of depression left hospital on average two to four days sooner than those on the dark side of the ward. So full spectrum sunlight can be effective in many forms of depression and can definitely improve your mood. What about what you smell? When I moved to Tucson, I smelled this amazing sweet smell in, after a rain. And it turned out it was creosote. The creosote bushes after the rain smell very sweet. And a colleague at the University of Arizona shared with me that when she moved out east, she so missed that creosote smell that she cut a sprig of creosote and brought it back with her and hung it in her shower every time she felt homesick. So a lot of association of mood with odor, with fragrance, comes from memories. Even if you don't have creosote in your memory bank, there are fragrances and odors that actually change brain function. So lavender is a chemical. Not only does it smell sweet and it makes you feel calm, it's a chemical that, in fact, can induce slow-wave sleep in animals. So if place can make you happy, can it also make you well? Roger Ulrich, in a landmark paper in 1984 published in Science Magazine, 
showed that patients who were recovering from gallbladder surgery who had views of a grove of trees left hospital on average a day sooner, needed less pain medication, and had fewer negative nurses' notes than patients who had a view of a brick wall. Not surprising, but he showed it. So how could this work? Well, we know in integrative medicine, where we incorporate mind-body methods, healthy diet and exercise, together with conventional medical treatments, we know that these integrative approaches like meditation, tai chi, yoga, exercise, psychotherapy, on and on, reduce the stress response, kick in the vagus nerve, that nerve that controls the relaxation response that slows your heart and makes the heart rate more effective and actually enhances the immune response. And at the same time, we know from brain imaging studies that areas of the brain rich in endorphins become active, areas of the brain important in what we call the reward or desire pathways rich in dopamine become active. And all of this is good for your mood and good for your immune system. And remember that study uh, showing that your chromosomes can look 10 to 17 years older than your chronological age if you're chronically stressed. Well, the good news is these kinds of integrative approaches have been shown recently by Dean Ornish and Alyssa Eppel and their colleagues at UCSF that people who are chronically stressed continue to shorten their chromosomes. People who engage in a simple lifestyle change, mindfulness meditation three days a week, 30 minutes of walking a day and a healthy Mediterranean diet actually not only stop that shortening of chromosomes, but they increase the length of those telomeres. So no matter how stressed you are, no matter how long you've been stressed, don't give up hope. You can start now and help to reverse those negative effects of stress on the body. What I propose is that place can do the same thing. It can do it by helping you to engage in those salubrious activities and also by reducing the stress response. We know that place and features of place can cause stress. We actually know this way better in animals than we know this in people. We know exactly how many mice you can put in, how many square centimeters of a cage, and how many rats you can put in, how many square centimeters. We know the texture on the wall, the color of the lights, the intensity, the sounds, the smells, and so on. We need to start applying this to people. Elements of place that cause stress, noise, crowding, mazes, too much light, too little light, foul odors. Does this remind you of any particular kind of building? How many of you think of a hospital as a calming, soothing spa? <laughs> My goal, and our goal at the University of Arizona Institute on Place and Well-Being, is to come to a time when I ask that question and people do not laugh. Because if we can put the Mars rover on Mars and we can send rocket ships up to the moon, we can surely design place that does not stress. And since we know that stress can make you sick, it doesn't make sense to put a person into a place if they're already stressed and already sick. It doesn't make sense to put them into a place that makes them sicker and more stressed. So what are the implications of all this? We can begin to incorporate elements in design at all scales, hospitals, office buildings, buildings of all sorts, urban design that reduce stress and enhance well-being. So here are some examples. This is the Diamond Children's Hospital in Tucson, Arizona. It does not look like a hospital. This is the entrance lobby. It looks more like Disneyland. This is on purpose so the children can play with the interactive walls. The hospital has enormous uh, windows with gorgeous views of the Santa Catalina Mountains. The seventh floor intensive care waiting room has one of those views. And I didn't want to take a picture to invade the privacy of the parents who were sitting there at this most terrible time in their lives. But I asked a mother, how do you feel sitting in this place? And she said, I love to sit here. It makes me feel so calm. 
This when her child was in the intensive care unit at this worst time in her life. This is a view out the window from the Tucson Medical Center, again, of the Santa Catalina Mountains. The Tucson Medical Center started off in the 1930s as a tuberculosis sanatorium. These were the principles of the sanatoria of the late 19th and early 20th century. You had to have sweeping views, lots of sunlight, patios for people to sit out on, places for people to sit with their friends for social support. More and more, these principles are being incorporated into all sorts of health uh, facilities. This is an example of a health facility in Waveney, Connecticut, which uh, shows that the, the, there's a main street that was designed to look like a main street, to look actually like Disneyland, because the elder uh, care facility had residents that came from small towns that had main streets that looked like this. So they wanted their, their residents to be in a familiar setting with landmarks to help them navigate, with views to the outside so they should know whether it's light or dark, whether it's time for dinner or, or breakfast, and with sight lines to the bathroom. You can design space to help people even whose memory of place is fading, as happens in Alzheimer's, to help them to be more independent for a longer period of time. The US military is really embracing these principles. We're working with the Bethesda National Military Medical Center, uh, Walter Reed and uh, the Navy uh, merged, and uh, we're working to develop a new uh, retrofitted forest glen that has ADA accessible paths so that the wounded warriors with traumatic brain injury, amputations, uh, and other illnesses can walk from their residences on base through a calming, quiet glen instead of along a noisy urban path. And we're going to be doing studies to measure the effects of the stress response in these two different environments. The military is also putting in labyrinths in their national intrepid centers of excellence that they build for outpatient care of uh, people with wounded warriors with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. A labyrinth is a walking meditation you follow a path on the floor. It forces you to walk slowly, breathe slowly, be in the moment. It's based on the ancient patterns of labyrinths that are scattered all over Europe and beyond. Uh, and this one was modeled on the 13th century uh, cathedral at Chartres. The Center for Health Design has done studies to measure the health benefits of these kinds of interventions in 50 hospitals across the United States. And they did find a number of different improvements in health outcomes, as well as improved staff and patient satisfaction. And what's good for the patients and the staff and the families is good for the bottom line. The Center for Health Design calculated that the extra $12 million that it would cost to build such a hospital up front could be recouped in the first, 12 year, uh, first year of operation of the hospital. The same applies to office space. We did a study with the General Services Administration in Washington, DC. Uh, the General Services Administration builds all the government buildings. 2.4% of all buildings are built and maintained by the GSA. And we found in a retrofitted office space that people in the new, beautiful, light, airy office space with views had significantly lower stress responses on two different measures compared to people in the old, cramped uh, office space. And the GSA has gone on to retrofit their headquarters in Washington, DC, to have beautiful views, light and airy spaces, and even a roof garden where people can work. And this applies also to schools. The Tucson Unified School District is working with the University of Arizona at Tucson to install gardens in schools. And the happy faces on the children say it all. And this applies at all levels of education. This is a Sonoran Desert Garden outside of the University of Arizona College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture, which attracts students to study in it in what used to be a parking lot. So the challenge is whether, when, and how these design interventions can have an effect. We need to prove this in quantitative terms. And the good news is we can do this now with non-invasive measures that are available. There are all kinds of non-invasive measures. 
coming online every day. We call it mobile health or personalized health. I'm sure many of you have these little wristbands that you can wear when you're jogging to, to know whether what the status of your stress response and your heart is. We're developing a method to measure stress and immune biomarkers in sweat. Um, we have bioengineers at the University of Arizona who have developed smart socks that will tell you when you're about to fall, not after you've fallen. <laughs> and we're creating an institute on place and well-being at the University of Arizona linking the College of Medicine, the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, and the College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture, and many colleges, institutes, and centers across the university. And our goal is to do the research, to understand how place can affect well-being, to incorporate these principles into curriculum at all levels, and to incorporate these principles into practice, and collaborate with the community to bring this, these principles into, uh, into the real world. We are at a very exciting time in science, in medicine, in design and in environmental health, where we can layer different kinds of data one upon the other to understand these principles in a very precise and complex way. When you predict the weather, you layer atmospheric information one on top of the other, wind speed, light, temperature, humidity. With GIS, geographic in uh, information technology, you can layer information about the soil, maps, bioevents, and view sheds. And we're beginning to be able to do this in medicine. We can go all the way from the genome to the exposome and everything in between. We are beginning to be able to layer this data, human data, linking genome, proteome, emotions, behavior. What I'm proposing is that we can begin to layer the physical data of the environment on top of the human, biological, and emotional data to understand in real time and real place exactly how the environment that you're in is affecting your health and well-being. So the new frontier of health is person and place-centered health and well-being. The new frontier of environmental health is going beyond removing toxins towards adding features of the environment that promote emotional well-being. And the new frontier of green design is to add human health and well-being outcomes to green design standards. And this, in fact, is being done by major standard-setting uh, design organizations across the country and around the world, the General Services Administration, the US Green Building Council, um, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, and so on. You can create and find your own happy place even if you don't have access to such major institutions. You can put in favorite pictures of favorite places, little plants, happy colors, bright lights, and so on. My father didn't have the luxury during World War II of doing that. He couldn't create a beautiful space. He couldn't look out the window at a beautiful space. He could not walk outside in nature in a concentration camp somewhere in Transnistria during World War II. But he found solace in his favorite psalm, the 23rd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Place can give you sustenance, even if you are in the valley of the shadow of death. 
you can go there in your mind and find your healing place, just as my father did. I thank you.